Good afternoon, grade 11. Sorry I'm not there with you today, um, but I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about Pascal's triangle. Some of you may have heard about this um, mathematician before because um, he discovered a really interesting pattern. He um, described it as Pascal's triangle. So it's a particular type of triangle that is formed by having a 1 at the peak of a triangle. And then every number thereafter is the summation, is the sum, of the two terms directly above it. So what this looks like is we're going to start our column off with a 1 up front. On the second row, we're going to envision that these values, or on the left-hand side of 1, since there's nothing there, I'll erase these zeros in a second, but there's two little zeros up top. 0 plus 1 gives me a 1 value here. 0 plus 1 on the right gives me another 1. I've now created the first two columns of a, um, sorry, the first two rows of a Pascal's triangle. As I expand from here, 1 plus 1, notice we're adding adjacents here, gives me 2. But again, on the outside, I realize that there's nothing there. There's a 0. 0 plus 1, when I add them together, gives me the same value here, which is 1. You can see that the outside of my triangle will always be kind of shifted with 1 values. It's always 1 on the outside. We continue the pattern. When I add in the middle, 1 and 2 adds to 3. And on the same thing here, 1 and 2 adds to 3. To get our outside terms, remember we need to go in both directions. The little 0 on the outside plus 1 adds to 1, and the same thing here. Let's continue for two more rows. 3 and 3 are going to add, as well as these terms here. So I'm adding the two adjacent terms above to get my term here. 6, 4, 3 plus 1 is 4, and again, if I want the outside values, so we always want to end our triangle on the outside. I have 1 plus 0 is 1. We'll do one more row, but this pattern continues indefinitely. The arrows indicate the summation that's going to occur, and I always go outside as well. Um, with this, um, we're going to add 0 plus 1 on the outside, gives us 1. 5 on the inside, 6 plus 4, 10, 10, 5, and 1. And if I notice, each row has a pattern. If I were to look, we have 1, 2, 1. The next row, 1, 3, 3, 1. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. They're symmetrical kind of about this line here. If you look, the right-hand side looks the exact same as the left-hand side. Now there's a bit of terminology we want to refer to here. We'll start by talking about our rows. The one thing that is interesting about our rows and a little bit different is we don't start off with row one, but rather we talk the top row as row zero. This becomes row one, row two, three, and you can see that I have drawn five rows. Row five. Okay. With that, Notice it's the first time 5 appears in row 4, the first time row 4 appears. The reason we call the first row row 0 is because no addition has occurred. So that's the first of our terminology. The second is to talk about these diagonal lines as columns. Starting at the left-hand side, the top column, just like our rows, is called column 0. I think there should be an N there. This makes this column 1, column 2, and we would continue depending on where we're looking. And I'll add one more row in here. So that continues 3, this will be column 4, and this last one is considered to be column 5. So here's our definitions below. We said that a row was the horizontal collection of numbers, 
And our columns are our diagonals, or the diagonal collections of numbers. Referring to yesterday, we talked about the word term, and I meant a specific number in a row or a column. So the terms are the individual numbers. For example, the five above is considered a term. And they're a term in a specific row and a specific column. Notice here, row is n, and we use column defined by the variable r. So we'll see that a little bit as we move forward. Our term notation, when we talk about this, this is a bit different for today. Term notation indicates not just the term, whether it's term one, but the row and the number. So this is term n comma r. That's how we talk about this, where n, both n and r are subscript. I'll maybe make that a little more clear. n comma r, where n is our row number and r is that column number. We're going to go through two examples here. The first, before we start that though, we're going to look at the recursive formula. A recursive formula is backwards thinking. Consider it took this term plus the term in green, we summed them, and they added to what I will refer to as the pink term. So to come up with that pink term, which is in a specific row and a specific column, remember if we considered these two to be our column numbers, this would be our final row n, this would be our row above n minus 1. If I were to consider what that would look like for the columns, the diagonals, this is column r, and this would be column back, r minus 1. So what does that look like for a recursive formula in our notation? To get the term n comma r specifically, I would get term n minus 1 comma r minus 1. That's the term above. And I'm going to add it to term n minus 1 comma r. Notice when I am adding, I am adding, and I'm going to add color so we can see. So the term that came before, this is my n minus 1. Notice that is still, I guess I'll go back to green since the second one is green. They are in the same row. The row number is the same because they were both a row above. But the term on the left had a column of r minus 1, it was 1 back, and my final term had a column of r, which is the same row as my final value. So notice in this equation, there is no n. Um, it is just the r and n minus 1s. This will make a lot more sense as we continue to go through. Um, if you want to stop your computer right now and look up recursive formulas for a Pascal's triangle, there are lots of videos available. I'm going to go on to do two examples, um, and, then, and then we'll see how this works. So it says, using this sequence notation, please determine the equation or equivalent term for this. So right now, this is my term number, term n comma r. That's what this comes out to be. If I am looking, remember, to find the, what is the resultant term, it says I had to add from the term above. The two terms above were in row 4, which means my final value should be in row 5. Since I've added 1 to 2, remember my final value is the same. Oh, sorry. My final value, my r value, is the same as my column number. So in this scenario, my column number is 2. The resultant is 5 comma 2. Let's practice a few more kind of random scenarios with that. So as a few extras, if I had term, let's say 6 comma 2 plus term 6 comma 3, my resultant term is one row down, term 7, row 7, pardon, and this would be term 3. It is always the larger 
of the two. If I were to do term 0 comma 1 plus term 0 comma 2, my resulting term is in row 1 comma 2. It's the largest of those columns. For example, B, again, pause as you feel necessary. Um, we are looking at an example where I'm subtracting. So this is the row and the column subtracting row and column. My resultant, remember I'm subtracting them, is going to be the lowest row. This is one of the harder types of questions. And always the highest value. So when I'm subtracting, taking the lowest row and the highest value, which is the opposite of what we just did when we added a row. At this point, we're going to move on and add some patterning or some really cool applications to binomial expansions. This is something we saw a long time ago where we talked about having x plus 2 all squared. If I were to expand this value, it is x plus 2 times x plus 2. And we expanded this by foiling those terms out. There's a really cool application of Pascal's triangle, which allows us to expand any binomial to any degree, whether it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 100, whatever degree, by looking at um, how that relates to our Pascal's triangle. So we're going to just look and observe the following expansions. Here, if I exp expand a plus b to the power of 0, I get 1. Notice that is the first um, value in my Pascal's triangle. When I have a and b, notice it is 1a plus 1b. I get the ones here. If I were to expand a, expand a plus b squared, I get 1a squared and 1b squared on the outside. And notice what's happening in the inside term. I'm left with 2ab. We look at continuing the pattern for the cubed and the fourth term. Notice the outsides all have coefficients of 1. When I expand my cubic, notice the degree. I'm going to go with some orange here. The cube term, I have a 3 and a 3. And in the very last one, we'll see what other colors we can get in here, 4, 4, and in the middle, 6. And you see those exact same patterns happening on both sides. So by looking at or knowing Pascal's triangle, I can know the coefficients of any expansion. What I'd also like to point out to you is what these values mean. Notice we said our first row was called row 0. When I expanded a plus b to the power of 1, this was row 1. The coefficient tells me the row number. And I, I didn't mean coefficient, I meant exponent. The exponent shows me those different row numbers. So that's something, a kind of cool thing to note as well. Um, we're going to do two examples where we're going to expand these, and then you'll have um, a challenge one at the end. So let's make this to the exponent of 5. It is something that we haven't seen before, so I'll maybe just add it into our chart above before we start. An exponent of 5 would be a to the 5th plus 5a4, b plus 10a cubed b squared plus 10 a squared b cubed plus 5 a b to the fourth and b to the fifth. So that's an expanded version. Now we're going to look at the patterning. As I go from left to right, let's look at the pattern on a. The exponent goes from 5 to 4 to 3 to 2 and in the last term there are no a's. b does the opposite pattern. It starts with no b's then there's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that's a nice pattern that we're going to use to kind of help us with that expansion. So expand a plus b to the fifth. If you can't remember Pascal's triangle, you could take your time foiling it, but that would take a long time. 
I'm going to start with the highest exponent. And maybe we'll, let's change this to the sixth, because I just did the fifth above. So the highest exponent is six. I'm going to skip kind of as I go over. Notice there's a plus sign in between, so I'm just going to add a few pluses as I go. A goes to the sixth, it then is to the fifth, to the fourth, cubed, squared, one, and then nothing. I go back to the B term. B starts with nothing, so there's nothing here. Then I'm left with B, B squared, B cubed, B to the fourth, B to the fifth, and I'm left with B to the sixth. Now that I have all of my exponents, I need to deal with the coefficients. So I'm just going to move the plus signs over a little bit. In my sixth row of my expansion, it goes 1, 6, adds to 15, 20, 15, and back to 6. So if I were looking to do that, remember I'm either using a completed Pascal's triangle to solve for these coefficients, or I'd build them up on the side, meaning I would take my fifth row, which is 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, and 1, and solve for those values by adding them. Remember, those values were 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, and 1. So it comes from adding the two previous terms up from row 5 to get row 6. And again, that's how I got those coefficients um, for the terms above. Before we look to expand a minus c cubed, on the left-hand side, take a second and expand a plus c cubed. My coefficients we'll deal with in a second. I'm going to go from a to a squared to a cubed. Then I'm going to go back to the c. There's no c in the first one. c here, c squared, and then the last one is c cubed. I need the coefficients out front, uh, and to get those coefficients, I'm looking at the terms row 3, 1, 3, 3, 1. So 1, 3, 3, and 1. That is the expanded version of the plus sign. We're going to take that and rewrite it on the left-hand side, but I'm going to have no terms in the middle, no positive signs. So I'm just writing the coefficients out individually. And c cubed is our last term. And what is different when I have a negative sign in here, it's going to alternate my signs here. It goes negative, positive, negative. So the only thing it's changing is the sign. The coefficients remain the same. Our last example is definitely an extension problem. It is a hard, harder example because I have a fractional value for a. It's not going to change the way we approach this. I know I'm looking at expanding row 4. If you want to practice right now, coming up with the coefficients, you can start by making your own triangle. 3, 3, 1, and that's row 0, 1, 2, 3. I need to go one more. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So that is row 4. Those are the coefficients I'm going to use. We start with our a values, and then I'll add the coefficients in. Remember we said to the fourth, in the next one, it is cubed, and it goes down. This is squared, a over 2, and the last one has no terms at all. We're going to come back and fill that in with x. Remember the first term has no x values. The second term will have an x to the 1, x squared, x cubed, and the last one should end in the highest degree possible, 4. I now go back and fill in my coefficients. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. 4 and 1. And since everything is a, uh, addition in this, the positive sign here, we add positive signs throughout to make sure my values are a little more distinct. In a question, this gets you three marks. So that's exactly what I'd be looking at um, to say kind of three marks out of 
four. So if you can get to this step, you are wonderful. To get your final mark, all I'm doing is I need to simplify with my exponent. So a to the fourth over two to the fourth, which is 16. We're gonna add it with four. This is a cubed. There's an x. And then two cubed is eight. Um, keep going, six, this becomes a squared. X squared and the coefficient on the bottom, two squared is four. The last two terms, I'm left with uh, 4ax cubed all over 2, and the last one is x to the 4th. That got you your final mark. And for 1, communication is making sure I simplify the values here. Your final value would read a to the 4th over 16, a cubed x all divided by 2, this is going to be 3a squared x squared all over 2, and then 2ax cubed plus x to the fourth. So that communication is just making sure I'm taking the time to simplify. One last fun fact before I leave you today is that the sum of a row, if I were to add up all the terms in a row, is 2 to the n, where n is my column number. So for example, what is the sum of row 8? If I were to add up all the terms in row 8, it is 2 to the power of 8. Okay, so there's a little fun fact for today. Taking a second, if you need to go back through anything today, please feel free. And if not, you're starting your work in your textbook, page 378, 1 to 7. Thanks for listening, guys.